Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of Robert Maudsley, Britain's most dangerous prisoner. Or is he? Hmm, let's go. Sin and Tonic! I chose beer today. Bit naughty, isn't it? Is that a sin? It's not gin. (laughs) Mm. Beer is my stress alcohol and it has been quite stressful. I must say, wet lip. Anyhow, I've missed you very much. I'm glad to be back. I think for the month of December, we are just going to have to take my face and my hair as it comes because I am squeezing a lot in. Don't like it. It's not my favourite way to live, but I feel really good to be here. So I'm going to take that as a win. Anything that I'm enjoying at the moment, I'm clinging on to. For today's story, we are off to Liverpool. Liverpool? If you can hear that ticking, it's because I had the coals on. It's chilly here. Robert Maudsley was born in 1953 and he was one of 12 children. 12. Born in Liverpool, brought up in Liverpool, not in a conventional or happy way at all. When Robert was six months old, himself and his three older siblings were taken from their parents and they were put into care. They were placed in a, is it a nunnery? It was a, it was a home for children run by nuns. It wasn't a very nice place to grow up. It wasn't a nice place to be and that is putting it lightly and it was, there was a lot of abuse As they grew up, they just believed that they were orphans and that they had no parents. But that was not true. Their parents were alive. And despite having four children, their only four children at that time, taken into care, they went on to have eight more children. What? Why, man? Like, why? So the four eldest children, including Robert, they lived nine years. Nine years at Nazareth Care Home. That's what it was called, Nazareth Care Home. I just want to burst into song. Nazareth just makes me think of like Christmas, Nativity. It was on a starry night. All that jazz. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. I love all your branches. I freaking love this time of year. Mm. Decks are already up. Decks are up. Yes, before December. The children at the care home were beaten. That was, you know, the go-to punishment. And they were worked really, really hard and they were not fed enough. And what is just like a gut punch in this story, one of the many, is that, well, what happens next? Gut punch. After nine years living like this, somebody wants to adopt the eldest son. As part of the procedure for this, I don't know why, that they didn't just go, yeah, okay, they've been here for nine years. Like, yeah, they have to talk to the parents. So Robert's parents, they have to tell them that somebody would like to adopt one of their children. And the vileness of it is that even though they haven't had their children for nine years and their children don't even know that they exist, they say, no, thank you, we'll have them back. The children were then informed that they would be going home to their parents, their real parents, their real parents that have not wanted them for all this time. That's nice. What's that going to do to a kid? Anyway, so they go home, home. It's not home. They don't even, they don't remember it. They don't know these people. They get given to these strangers. And wouldn't it be nice if it was nicer than that care home, but it was absolutely much worse. They would beat their children. I'm pretty sure that their kids were used to that at this point from growing up in this nunnery. They would also send their children out to steal. And if they got caught or it went wrong or they didn't steal enough, they would beat them, you know, more. And I think that must have been massively like psychological, like the damage to, that's going on at this point, right? Because imagine that you get sent to these strangers, they're not your family. And by the way, their living conditions are just squalor. There's no furniture for the kids. There's no beds. They sleep on the floor under their coats. Yum. Really, really pleasant. What? And I read that they were like under social services or what have you. But it, <sighs> 
That's what they allowed them to go home to. Okay. They grew up in a nunnery as well, so they would have been taught that stealing is wrong and, you know, all of that scripture and stuff that they would have had force-fed to them and just day in, day out. And then to go to this family where you're sent out to steal, you'd, I would just think, oh, that's it. I'm I'm going to hell. It must have been just horrible, really awful. I mean, that's minor. That's a minor thing but I did think it I was like mm, I bet that really messed with their head let alone the beatings and the not being fed and being locked in their room for weeks at a time weeks they would be locked in their rooms for weeks if they misbehaved sadly it was worse for Robert his father would uh, single him out the most at the worst Robert was locked in his room for six months and his father would come in about six times a day, four to six times a day, to beat him. And that was the only interaction with another person that Robert had. Shortly after this, Robert was removed from the family. He then spent the remaining years of his childhood in foster care. And as soon as he was 16, he left. He then became a drifter. He had no foundation, no family. And all of his siblings were told that he was dead. So when he was removed from from their home, I hate using the word home because it was it doesn't sound it's not a home is it for them at all. When they when he was removed from that place, yeah, the parents just said oh he's died. Nice. So Maudsley is basically out on the streets. He's drifting around doing odd jobs for a bit of money and he makes his way down to London. In this process, Maudsley becomes addicted to drugs. So when he gets to London, he's quite desperate to make money. So to fund his habit, he becomes a male prostitute. He's lonely, he is depressed, and he tries to commit suicide twice and he fails twice. He is then admitted at this period in his life to a psychiatric hospital more than once, like on a few occasions. Every time he goes in, he tells the staff that he has voices in his head telling him that he should kill his parents. Do you blame him? Voices in your head, even if that's just your thoughts, like even if that is literally just like, you know, I should, just, in a really normal way, maybe I should just kill those people. Like, you, cross my mind, mate, I'm not surprised. But yeah, like as with anything, he would have a stay, a little stint, and then he would be turfed out. At 21 years old, 21, Maudsley kills for the first time. In his police interview after this first killing, he would tell police what had happened. He said that that morning, the morning that he killed someone, he went into London with a coat, with a coat under his coat, he'd be hot, with a knife under his coat, hidden. Because he woke up that morning and he wanted to hurt somebody. That's what he said. Wanted to hurt someone. He couldn't find the right person or, you know, who knows what, you know, like, what, what's the right person? Who's that? So he, he couldn't, he hadn't found the right victim to hurt or kill. And then he bumped into somebody that he knew. And this guy was an, a client of his or a previous client. 30-year-old John Farrell. Farrell was already with another, you know, he, he had a male prostitute with him. He had already procured the services of another gentleman. But, and this would prove a fatal mistake for Farrell, he told this guy, cheers, Badgley, no thanks. And he went off with Maudsley. He takes Maudsley back to his flat and you know, things get spicy. And in that process, I'm not sure how he managed it, but you know, maybe Pharrell went for a pee. He put the knife under the mattress, under the bed, and then they uh, get busy with it. And all the while that they're busy, Maudsley is thinking about hurting him. He can't shake it off. He can't get it out of his head. He want, he, he said in his interview, like he wants to hurt he wanted to hurt him, hurt him and he couldn't get it out of his mind. When they're finished, they go to sleep. And when they wake up in the morning, Maudsley immediately, again, he says he has this feeling that he wants to hurt him and it hasn't gone away. 
He gets up, makes them both a cuppa, and just hopes that the feeling passes. And then, trigger. Because, and this is where one of the myths kind of comes into it, I, I think, because people, I, I saw in my research that a lot of people said that he was then shown pictures of underage boys and this triggered the attack. But in his interview, Maudsley doesn't mention that they are underage or anything like that. He doesn't state it as a reason for why he did what he did. There's no mention of that. Pharrell just starts showing Maudsley pictures of, you know, the young men that he slept with. And then Maudsley does attack Pharrell. Possible that the photos of young men some of which may have been underage. He, he might have been sleeping with Robert as a prostitute when he was a child. You know, at this point, Robert's 21. But he could have, they could have, he could have been an ex-client from when he was a lot younger. All of these things I'm not sure of. But he certainly didn't say to police in an interview, that is why I killed him, because he was showing me pictures of underage boys and it made me cross. That wasn't he wasn't it wasn't a vigilante attack. He had wanted to hurt him or someone since the day before. I think that's what the issue is, that he he was portrayed as somebody that you know, like um what's what is it called? You know when someone's like a like they, they kill the bad baddies. Is it like an anti hero? Hang on, wait. I can't think of the term. Help me. But do you know what I mean? Like I, he was portrayed as that, like a vengeance killer. But but that was not what was going on in his head. He wasn't like, oh, you've you've had sex with underage boys. I'm going to kill you. He'd wanted to kill and hurt somebody, anybody, from the day before. He's hidden the knife back in his coat pocket. You know, in the morning, he grabs that and he starts to stab Pharrell. First of all, he stabs him in the chest and this sends him flying and like tumbling over. Pharrell realises what's happened and he tries to make a run for it and leave the flat. And at that point, he trips over a chair and then Maudsley catches him and he then stabs him repeatedly in the back. He then strangles him to death and then hands himself into police. He said that while he was killing Pharrell, he was apologising to him. So this is a, this is just. This is just, you know, you know, it's all going on up there, isn't it? That made me think of a horror film and also like really chilling. That's really chilling. He said he just couldn't help it. He had to kill somebody and he couldn't help it and he just had to do it. Once he had killed Pharrell, he had the compulsion to go and do it again. So that's why he called the police because he was like, I'm going to I'm going to kill somebody again. I really want to. So he thought it was best to hand himself in. He was deemed not fit to stand trial. Must remember this. He was deemed at this point that he was not fit to stand trial. Okay. And he was sent to Broadmoor, which is a hospital for the criminally insane. And this is where it gets spicy. And I get confused. After he has been at Broadmoor for three years, quite a chunk of time, himself and another inmate called David Francis who is a convicted paedophile, they managed to get another inmate in a cell and like, hold him hostage and they're not very nice to him. A few months later, not long, not long, Maudsley with another inmate, a different inmate called David Cheeseman, what's it with the Davids in this place, they then do the same thing but to David Francis, the convicted paedophile. And they, they get him in a cell, and I won't go into too much detail because it's grim. They tie him up in the cell, barricade themselves in. No one can get in. No guards, nothing. And they are in there for nine hours. And in that nine hours, they horrifically torture David Francis. Eventually, Maudsley strangles him to death. I would be surprised if the staff that were there ever went back to work because they could hear what was happening and they were helpless. And sometimes Maudsley and Cheeseman would like show them things through the glass and stuff. It was just, it that it's just horrible, really horrible. At one point, Maudsley has fractured Francis's head 
And when they eventually let the guards in, they find that there's like a plastic spoon that's kind of been made into like a sharp thing. What's that called? Is that a shiv? A shiv. A shiv. I think that might be wrong. I don't know. I should know that word. Anyway, well then. And that's in the wound of the, you know, the skull. The skull? That's grim. Maudsley claimed that he had actually eaten some of his brain. I mean, bearing in mind, he's got like a spoon sticking out of his head, right? So you would be inclined to maybe believe that because clearly not, not all going on up there, is it? However, the pathologist came back and said that all of his brain was intact and that none of it had been removed or eaten or anything like that. So he hadn't. But this was enough to give him the name of Brain Eater and Hannibal the Cannibal. Shiv. Shiv. This uh, makeshift knife thing, I think it's a shiv, shiv, had, had been put into the ear through, you know, and had damaged the brain and then put into the wound in the head, but, but nothing had been eaten. Apparently the murder was revenge for a homophobic attack on one of Maudsley and Cheeseman's friends. Now, this dude is quite clearly insane in the membrane. He is in Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. That's where he is. That's where he has been for three years. Yes, he's insane, right? No one has disputed that fact. No one. He quite clearly has got a lot of mental health issues and I'm not excusing what he has done. He's killed someone that's terrible, but you can understand why he has mental health issues. Okay, let's say that. You you know, you can't excuse the murder, but you can understand why his brain is completely frazzled up because look at where he's come from. You know, he's had a horrific time. I think that's actually a good way of thinking about it because not everybody that has been abused and had horrible childhoods, and I think we all know people that have, Sadly, it happens a lot more than it should. But yeah, like if you think about that, there's a lot of people in the world that have had horrible, really horrible childhoods and they don't murder anyone. They don't do that. But I think it's very common for people that have had incredibly traumatic childhoods to have mental health issues. And this guy had a very, very traumatic like, where's the attachment and the love in his childhood? None of it. None. Not not any since he was born. And it's just, you know, it's so damaging. So damaging. Despite the fact that he's clearly insane. He's in Broadmoor. Yeah. Um, they now deem him fit to stand trial. Now. Now they do. Don't get that. Really don't get that. Why? Also... So he lives in Broadmoor. Is that what you would say? He resides there. And he was already deemed, you know, insane, not, not you know, not fit to stand trial previously. And now, after he has barricaded himself in a cell for nine hours and done what he has done, now he's not insane. Right. Now he's OK. <sighs> Don't get it. That's the first thing I'm just like, don't get that whatsoever. And he stands trial and obviously he is convicted and sentenced. Well, he's sentenced to manslaughter because they do accept that, you know, he's... I keep doing this, sorry. But they do accept that he's, you know, not all there. He is then sentenced to life in prison, but he is not sent back to Broadmoor. He's not. And I don't, I like I say, I don't understand it. Not at all. He is sent to live the rest of his days in Wakefield Prison. And he's not happy about it. And he wants to go back to Broadmoor, which is probably where he should be. Yeah, it really does feel like a dick move. It just does. Also, this feels incredibly stupid because in a matter of weeks, he's at it again. And it's almost like he got sent there. And did they lose the paperwork? 
Did they know what he'd done to be there? I don't know. Why were they not maybe like monitoring him? Because he has killed an inmate in his previous residence. Killed an inmate. So in prison, in incarceration, he has managed to kill another prisoner. And yet, he he is able to do it again. And that blows my mind. In July 1978, Maudsley wakes up in prison and he thinks to himself, I'm going to kill someone. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to kill seven people. Seven. That's the number he picks. Wakes up and just thinks, I'm going to kill seven people today. And he has a crack. He has a good go. He begins with 46-year-old Stanley Darwood. Now, he's in for life for killing his wife. Rhymes. Maudsley lured him into his cell and then proceeded to smash his head against the walls. He basically smashed this guy's head in. And that's how he killed him. And then strangled him. And he was able to do that. And I I find that just really... But I just find that, really? You knew what he was in for. He then hides Darwood's body under his bed. And then he keeps going. He keeps trying to lure more people into his cell. But it doesn't work. And a lot of the people afterwards, when they were interviewed, said that they could tell he there was something wrong. He was off. Like, you know, he was cray-cray. Eventually, he can't get anyone in his cell, so he goes hunting, basically, for another victim. He finds 55-year-old William Roberts. Now, William Roberts was in for sexually assaulting a seven-year-old girl. Roberts is lying on his bunk. Morsey goes in, he stabs him with a makeshift knife, and then he proceeds to smash his head against the wall and then strangle him. And after he has done that, so he's now killed two men in prison. Good one. He then goes to the guard's office and he places his weapons down on their desk and says that they should expect two less people at lunch or something. Do you know what I mean? Like when you do your roll call, there's two less prisoners, mate. My initial thoughts about this were, there were two. Is he trying to get back into Broadmoor? So he spent two, three weeks in Wakefield Prison. He wanted to be back there. So did he do this? Is it, it, you know, look, I'm I'm insane, man. I'm just going to keep going. I'm insane. Send me back. Or was it literally what it is? And he just, he wakes up and his brain goes, oh, need to kill someone, seven people, whatever, you know. In which case, he needs to be in Broadmoor for the criminally insane. He is then placed in solitary confinement while they work out what the hell to do because he is a danger to himself and all of the inmates. And then in 1979, he is tried for the two murders in prison. So he went into prison, into Broadmoor, with one murder. You know, he's killed one person. Not that that's good, but you know what I mean. And then he's now a serial killer. He became a serial killer in prison. Now, that does not look good. That does not look good on the prison system at all, does it? When he was interviewed, he said that he he honestly thinks that if he'd have killed his parents, if he'd have done that first, when, you know, like when he was younger, if he'd have just killed them, it, all of this would never have happened and he would be free. He said that every time he killed somebody, he just had his parents in mind. And he believes that if he'd have just killed them, it would have given him closure and none of this would have happened. He was found guilty, and he was given a whole life sentence at this point, so he's never, ever going to come out of prison. Okay, so we need to, you know, there needs to be a plan in place. How are you going to deal with somebody in the prison population that kills inmates? Like, what's the, you know, what's the plan here? What's the workaround? And you, it blew my mind. It blew my mind. In 1983, they set about making a place for Maudsley to exist. I'm not even going to say live, to exist. They called it the cage. It was built in the basement of Wakefield Prison, underground. To get to the cage, you have to go through 17 steel locked doors. The cage is 18 foot by 14 foot, which is bigger than a normal cell. But the reason for that 
is because he's not just going to sleep here and eat his meals here and have supervised time in the prison population. Do you know what I mean? No, he's going to be here all the time. So they made it bigger. It's made from thick perspex, like a bulletproof glass. He can be seen at all times. There's no privacy in there, even when he's going to the loo. Nice. It has a steel door and there is a small gap where food can be pushed in. He's only allowed plastic cutlery and plastic plates and things like that. I think he's only allowed a spoon. We've all seen what he can do with a spoon. It's a bit silly. He can see one centimetre of the sky through a ventilation hole. And he is in there for 23 hours of a day. One hour he gets to exercise in like a really, like a walled, high walled courtyard thing. Allowed a pen to write, but not stamps. So he can't communicate with his family. Why? Not allowed TV or music. Why? He didn't have a haircut for 12 years because they wouldn't let somebody go in to cut his hair. Why? Who the, who do they think this guy is? Like Jason Bourne? There are people in prison, in Wakefield prison, that have done vile, I'm not, I don't want to like judge it against each other, but like probably worse things than what he's done. And they're just out and about in, in the general population. And I know, of prison I mean, but I know that he's obviously proven, he's proven twice, that he can't just be in a free environment in prison because he will just kill somebody and I know that he cannot be out in the world obviously so it's like well well, yeah what do you do with him but it's like really so you've gone from well he can't be just in mainstream you know walking about in open prison so we'll just lock him in the basement never let him see the light of day okay that just blows my mind and also the thought of like you know reform and stuff like that where's that come into it then if he's locked in a cage that doesn't that's not okay not at all and I'll come to that actually because it, it's interesting and I feel like what well, like why can't he have music and tv and a stamp why not because what it feels like is that you are using power and authority like to really like you think you can kill someone in prison and make a mockery out of us have this. It just feels angry, vengeful. It doesn't feel like reform, prison. It, it's so far from that. Like, we don't do that to people, but we are. That's what's happened. It absolutely blows my mind. What I just described is how he lived for 44 years. That is not reform. That is not prison. That is torture. In the 1990s, for a few years, he was taken out of his cage. Unbelievable. And he was given therapy. This was in Parkhurst Prison. And I don't, I, I couldn't find enough information about that. Like, he didn't kill anyone. What were they doing? Was he monitored? Like, I would like to know that. I'm going to try and find that information. But I couldn't, I couldn't find it easily. Um, so I'm I'm going to try and do a bit of digging there because I really want to know, like, what, how did they handle him then? So he had therapy for three years and it started to work, not in the sense that he was ever going to be reformed and able to be out in the world, but he started to, he started, like, at first, the, the therapist, oh, what was his name? Bob Johnson. He was a prison psychiatrist. Bob said they came to an understanding so at first you know he said if I'm nervous if you make me nervous I'm going to leave and he would sit by the door of the cell and he he would leave if he felt if he felt nervous and I've heard some pieces of what Maudsley would say he had developed a speech impediment because he'd been on his own for so long and when he's talking when he's when I heard snippets of him and Bob you can just tell he's a broken human being He's almost like through his therapy with with Bob, he's piecing together why he is how he is and what's happened. One thing that you do get from listening to him is that he's clearly mentally ill. And what I just don't understand, and again, I couldn't find information on why 
But when he started to make progress, they took him back to the cage and he was no longer allowed therapy. And that Bob said it was it, he was very angry about it and very frustrated. Again, why? Is this an experiment to see how far you can push someone until they just, I don't know, break, die? In 2000, he petitioned to have his solitary confinement lifted slightly, and they said no. And then he said, can I have a budgie? He wanted a pet, he wanted contact with something. They said no. When they said no to that, he then asked for a cyanide capsule. Just said, look, I just, I'll just end it, I'll just end my life. Quite honestly, why not? Why not? At that point, wouldn't you want to? Just, what's the point? I keep coming back to like what is different about him because like I say when you if you if you could look at who's in Wakefield prison and look at what they've all done they've all done horrible vile absolutely disgusting vile awful crimes up to you whether you think they're worse or not is it because he killed three people in prison and it just looks bad. Is that like that? I don't, I don't get it. He is treated so wildly differently. And I do understand that he, his crimes were all committed in prison. So they're, they've got to go to another level to protect the prison population. I just, it feels, I don't know, am I a broken record? It just feels a bit much, doesn't it? Is it to make a massive statement to other prisoners? Don't kill anyone in prison because this is what will happen to you. Or is it just really easy? Build a cage, shove him in it, job done. For example, I don't understand why he can't have music, TV and um, relationship with his family through written form or phone. Why not? Why can't he have one phone call whenever they have it one, once a week? Why are all of these things taken away as well? You know, don't get that. In 2021, he was told that he will never leave solitary confinement and that they have decided he will spend his whole life in solitary confinement. Can you imagine hearing that? Their reasoning, he's been alone so long now that it would be very dangerous to let him back in. What the hell? That statement means that you, you know that by keeping him alone so long, you have made it worse. A genius. Give the man a fucking budgie. Apparently, very recently, he has been allowed TV and music in his cage and he was given a PlayStation. This is a guy that for most of his, like, you know, 44 or more years, only had a pen. Interestingly, I thought when I read that he had been allowed to have some, you know, TV music and a playstation i thought i wonder i wonder what how that has reshaped his existence because just the thought of what he did have for 44 years is enough to make you like insane and then the thought of having even one of those things would you would feel like what well, i would feel like that was the biggest luxury like having a TV to watch. I'd watch that all freaking day long. I'd just be like, just so it's something that can take you out of where you are. Again, the same with music. I'd just listen and absorb into, you know, like it would feel like such a luxury. And what's interesting is since they have afforded him these luxuries, he has now chosen that his cell is his home. So before he found it, it was a, it was prison and it was a cage and now he sees it as safe where he should be and he's happy and he doesn't want to leave it he is so conditioned that now tv music playstation and one hour of outside time is enough for him i feel like it was a bit different for me this case because it was more i found it so Absolutely. I think I focused more on him and his incarceration because it just blew my mind. But yeah, I, I couldn't not cover and share my feelings on that one. Had to, had to get that one out. Yeah, really did.
Not much has been occurring for me in my life because I have just been writing essays and studying and reading. I swear I dream it. I dream this stuff that I am researching and writing essays on. I sometimes in my dreams am like reading through my essay. It is insane. And it is just slowly sucking the life out of me. Not going to moan about it anymore. I'm bored of that. So I'm just going to crack on. And um, yeah, it's over in May. Do I look like a werewolf? Anyway, I missed you a lot. I did. And I was so upset when I realised that I just, I, I was running out of time in my week. And I just couldn't do last week. And I got upset. I did. I did get really, really upset. I was I, I went through stages of grief, I think, with that. But I can let it go now because I'm up the shed and I've made myself like a nice schedule. So, yeah, it's all good in the hood. How are you all anyway? Let me know how you're doing, what you've been up to. Are you decorated for Christmas? Are you not? What festivities have you got planned for the month of December? Fill me in. I love Christmas, so you're just going to have to deal with that for the whole of December because I love it. I love talking about it. I love everything about Christmas. So, yeah, fill me in with what you will be up to. I love hearing about it. I'm going to go and have a cup of tea. Cool down. Love you. Miss you. Can't wait to see you next week. So glad that I'm back. Have a beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous weekend because you deserve it. And I love you. See you soon. Bye.